the learn policy I think that we've talked uh, in a lot more detail about was Cassie uh, running a 5K and then running the 100 meter dash. Uh, and that that's a particular flavor of control policy, which is actually giving control of all of the degrees of freedom of the robot uh, to the underlying learned policy. And that's actually different than what you just got working uh, last week, um, which I find fascinating. So that, you know, you want to describe maybe a little bit of the difference between, you know, RL control of limbs versus what you started working on last week. Yeah, well, there are kind of two different flavors of problems, right? In in one, there's a, a specific sort of goal or objective construct, you know, whether it's a specific target or a goal region or something that you're trying to attain. And and you're using learning as a mechanism to basically fit a model policy, whatever your mathematical structure is, to try and optimize against that specific thing. Um, and so that's, you know, a very useful, powerful, broad area of, of learning, reinforcement learning to basically construct this this model and uh, collect data about it, collect feedback about what works and what doesn't, and use that to basically fill in the the structure of the model, depending on depending on the nature of it. Sometimes you're filling in the structures, sometimes you're uh, fitting a particular model structure's uh, parameters to, uh, uh, to try and produce an output. But the idea is that you have a, a mathematical representation of kind of everything in the space that you're working with that's kind of your framework for doing this. Uh, the project I worked on recently with Digit uh, is using this new space of, of large language models. And so this is a relatively new area where, uh, well, I mean, the area has existed for a while, but there's been some very, very Im impressive uh, upgrades to the technology in recent years where it's possible to basically take a model that's not specifically trained on what Digit's doing or a mathematical framework or any sort of structure around what Digit's doing. It's instead trained on a very large corpus of data about just things in the world in general, right? Things humans do, things in human worlds, um, objects, ideas, semantics, and this very large model, right? And these are very, very large models, billions of nodes, uh, in a huge network, come to encode this interesting representation of this idea of a, a general semantic world. And you can create queries against this general model of a semantic idea of a world. And if you generate the queries right, then you can have these models generate out you know, a set of tokens which encodes a response. And that's actually a fairly groundbreaking thing like that this is even that this is even possible with LLMs. Uh, that you can train up a model on a generalized representation of just the world structure and say, and now if I tell you to complete this sentence where the first part of the sentence is a question and then the second part of the sentence, you're going to tell me the answer to that question. And for it to not just generate something that's uh, a, a sort of list of words that are sort of vaguely related to the question, but to actually generate something which actually contains knowledge representation about the corpus that it's been trained on like i find that amazing that that is something that we've been able to achieve but now that we have figured out how to do that obviously there's many caveats to the complexity of those answers but you can engineer those prompts and you can build upon them to have them form fairly complex generated responses and so in this case we can form prompts which are going into this llm that are specifically asking or prompting for uh, questions about digit. So digit is in this space. Digit is seeing these items. What would digit do next if it was asked to solve a particular problem? And it'll actually generate a response. And the interesting part is that we can construct that response such that it's in the parlance of things that digit can do. And that's where it gets particularly interesting. You now have the ability to encode the embodiment of digits capabilities again in a form that this semantic reasoning engine can understand and it'll produce a response which is the thing which is out of the set of things that digit can do like picking up objects moving around an environment putting objects places and you know additional stuff like doing gestures or walking around if you think that that's helpful to your cause uh, and it will produce some structured response that can do, you know, sequences of these things in various forms. And of course, now the question becomes, you know, 
what is the right way to harness that? And that's a really new and interesting question that now that we have these models available, a lot of people are scrambling to solve. Like, what is the right way to encode this question? What is the right way to decipher the results? Now, with uh, Digit in particular, one of the advantages we have is that Digit itself both has a very common semantic lexicon with the data set that, that the LLMs are trained on uh, because it is a human-sized, human-scale robot that can operate in human environments. That's the corpus of stuff that, that we've been training LLMs on largely. So we get a lot of value out of that. And the second part is we've built Digit to have a lot of physical intelligence, to be able to move around and interact in these environments, to be able to exert forces without, you know, um, disrupting human environments. And that means that it can, it can provide a sort of comprehensive lexicon of stuff to do that also makes sense. And so we're sort of able to work this from both ends in that we can, we can operate in an environment that is very aligned with what LLMs are capable of reasoning about, or reasoning is a strong word, but generating responses to, if that makes sense.